For more than a year, angry, hateful letters were sent to a first grade school teacher in a small mountain village in Pennsylvania. Many were sexual in nature. Some threatened violence. When scientists analyzed the letters, they found evidence that the stalker knew a lot about the victim, more than anyone could possibly imagine. Some hate mail began to arrive at the Cool Ball Learning Center, a public elementary school in the Pocono Mountains in eastern Pennsylvania. The letters were unsigned and sent to the principal, making serious allegations against a first grade reading teacher, Joanne Chambers. She had been teaching in the school district for the past eight years. Chambers brought a pot into school and then showed it in the faculty room, just like it was a big joke. I thought it was just somebody, a disgruntled employee. I just wanted to know who it was, and I thought it was a thing that you could, you know, sit down with that person and talk it out and fix it. Soon, letters were sent to Joanne Chambers herself at both home and at school. I can get you in one try. No one will approve it. They may not think so, but I'm smarter than all of you. You stupid. Letters were also distributed to other teachers found in mail slots in the faculty lounge. Joanne Chambers was popular with students and was an unlikely target of a hate campaign. She was married with a 10-year-old son and had no known enemies. I can speak with uh, assurance about Joanne's teaching abilities. Uh, she's highly recommended by uh, other teachers in the district. Uh, she was also highly respected by parents. Uh, she was an outstanding teacher. All her recommendations show that. It appeared that someone had a grudge against her. Look in Chambers' desk. She seems to like Jack Daniels. Chambers found the whiskey bottle in her desk drawer and said personal items were missing. There were things missing from my drawers. The picture of my child and myself and my friend and her daughter was taken from my desk. The police suspected that a fellow teacher or school employee was sending the letters, since they often alluded to activities going on inside the school. One of the letters contained an interesting clue. It was a snide reference to the school superintendent as Colonel Plink, a character in the Hogan's Heroes television series. A teacher in the school was once overheard referring to the superintendent in this way. Her name was Paula Noraki. Like Joanne Chambers, Noraki also taught first grade and had worked in the school district for 18 years. I was totally surprised. I was positive that it wasn't anybody in the building that it could be explained in some other way. The letters continued. But soon, there were other incidents. The first was something Joanne Chambers found under her desk. I went to start my lesson with my children and sat down in a chair and had a dress on and put my hand underneath to straighten the dress out. And I was covered with feces. And I couldn't even tell you what I felt like. I felt sick to my stomach. I felt hor I, it was like it was not happening. It was like this could not happen. The threatening letters were sent to the FBI lab in Quantico, Virginia. They found some partial fingerprints on the letters, but little else. One of the letters warned of possible poisoning. You really are a clueless bitch. I can write out and tell you how stupid you are. And you keep on doing the same stuff. I had four chances to drug your coffee this week. Or did I drug your coffee? Bitch, you make me sick. Just a few days later, a hidden camera captured several teachers entering Joanne Chambers' vacant classroom. One removed Chambers' coffee cup from her desk. 
it was Paula Naraki. The photograph of Joanne Chambers stolen from her desk was pasted onto a nude picture, photocopied and distributed throughout the schoolyard, mailed to parents' homes, and a copy was taped to the door of a local store. There were phone calls to parents saying that I was a lesbian, that um, I had AIDS, that, you know, th that I shouldn't be teaching their children. I can't tell you what, I mean, that was such a violation of my being. The FBI suggested that Joanne Chambers be given a lie detector test to validate her various claims. Paula Noraki also volunteered to take a lie detector test, hoping to clear her name after suspicions arose from the Colonel Clink reference and the coffee cup incident. One of the two failed on the most crucial question of all. After 10 months of threatening letters, X-rated pictures, and hidden video surveillance, police believed they had a break in the stalking case. Joanne Chambers and Paula Naraki both took lie detector tests about their knowledge of the threatening letters. Each was asked whether they were involved in making or sending any of the harassing letters. One passed. The other failed. I was told that I failed my polygraph. Paula Naraki became the primary suspect. I was very upset. I, I couldn't believe that it was making things worse instead of better. She was questioned about the incidents at the Kulwa Township Police Station, and she told uh, Chief Flugel, Tony, if I'm doing it, I don't know I'm doing it. And, and then she later said, you'll never prove it's me. I told him that I needed his help because this didn't make any sense. I needed somebody to really look into the whole situation accurately the way it evidently needed to be done. And I, I tried to make it sound as ridiculous as possible that if I had done whatever was going on, I didn't know I was doing it, which was totally absurd in, in my mind, in my way of thinking. Later on, she would say that, that she meant, it's not me, and you, you'll never prove it to me because it wasn't me. Noraki said she was videotaped taking Joanne Chambers' coffee cup because Chambers had asked Paula to get it for her. The surveillance videotape shows that Joanne Chambers and Paula Noraki were both in the classroom and left together just moments before Paula returned for the coffee cup. Police asked Noraki if they could search her home, and once again she voluntarily complied. They took with them an old typewriter that we had. They took um, different kinds of paper and different envelopes. The analysis of Naraki's typewriter revealed that it was not the one used to type the threatening letters. The paper and envelopes from Naraki's home did not match those used in the threatening letters either. Naraki's reputation as a by-the-book teacher and strict disciplinarian was in sharp contrast to Joanne Chambers' loose and fun-loving classroom style. The way the police saw it, Paula was jealous of Joanne Chambers' unconventional teaching style and the popularity that she gained from that style. Uh, Paula Naraki was more of a by-the-book conservative teacher who favored traditional teaching methods, whereas Joanne Chambers would show up in the classroom wearing jeans and a Mickey Mouse t-shirt and she would do things like stage water fights with the uh, school administrators, which uh, the police believe angered Paula Naraki. As the investigation continued, so did the threatening letters. Letters went out to parents, to parents saying that I was molesting their children. I thought my career was gone. I thought I was going to be in jail. I thought I didn't know what was going to happen. All it would have taken was one child, you know, misinterpreting a touch. And I was a touchy teacher. I mean, I put my arms around my children. I held my children when they were crying. By the fall of 1994, the letters included death threats. You die. For her own protection, Joanne Chambers was transferred to another school. Shortly after her transfer, a box in pink wrapping paper was found at the front door of the school. Inside was a Barbie doll the throat slashed with the razor blade and covered with paint 
the color of blood. The dress was identical to one often worn by Joanne Chambers. The hair was cut and styled like Chambers as well. I said goodbye to my husband. Like, I wanted him to remember me saying goodbye. I lived every day thinking that it was truly possible that it could be my last. In November of 1994, Chambers said a car tried to run her off the highway. She said she saw the face of the driver. I go off the road. I pull over. I look. She's looking right at me. I will never forget that look. Never. I will never forget it. She looked right at me. She said the face she saw was a face she knew. When Joanne Chambers called police to report that a car forced her off the highway, she said she recognized the face of the other driver. I saw her. She looked at me. I know that Paul Noraki was driving that car. Paula Noraki denied the allegation, but was arrested and charged with harassment, stalking, simple and aggravated assault, making terroristic threats, and recklessly endangering the life of Joanne Chambers, over 100 counts in all. I was finding out that I was charged with many, many horrendous things I had never heard about before. The school district suspended her from her teaching position with pay. If convicted, she could serve five years in jail. After Noraki's arrest, the letters, threats, and mailings stopped. Noraki maintained her innocence and hired both an attorney and private investigator to help. The investigator was a former state policeman, and even he admitted that Paula's situation did not look good. My first thought was, well, she's probably guilty. It, it just looked overwhelming when you looked at the at, at the whole complaint. The FBI found some partial fingerprints on the threatening letters, but they did not match Paula Noraki's. The defense team wanted to see if any DNA was present on the threatening letters. DNA is the chemical substance which exists in all of our cells. It can be found in blood, skin, hair, bone, saliva, sweat, semen, and mucus. No two individuals have the same DNA profile, except for identical twins. The prosecutor would allow DNA testing by the defense only if the results were fully disclosed, regardless of the outcome. Paula's defense team wanted to make sure she understood the ramifications of such an agreement. He asked, would there be any possible reason that any of my DNA should be on any of it, any possibility whatsoever? And I, I said, no. Paula, if we do this testing and your DNA is found on these stamps or, or envelope flaps, your chances, you're going to jail. We immediately said that we wanted to do it if it was something that would finally help shed some light on the whole thing. No, no problem with it at all. The cost of the DNA testing, approximately $7,000, would have to be paid by Paula Noraki. Blood samples from both Paula and her husband were sent to a local DNA lab, along with the threatening letters and the envelopes. The amount of DNA that would wind up on the back of a stamp or an envelope flap depends on how hard you lick the envelope, how much cells that you shed from the inside of your mouth. There are variables that it's hard to predict exactly what the value would be, but it is there. In some cases, there's more DNA than others. First, scientists use steam to gently remove the stamps from the envelopes. The back of each stamp and envelope flap was swabbed for epithelial cells, which come from saliva. DNA was found on the back of one set of stamps and on one envelope flap. The number of cells recovered was so small that forensic scientists performed a process called polymerase chain reaction, or PCR which amplifies or copies the DNA in those few cells to make enough for testing. The DNA from the stamps and envelope flap were added to the PCR mixture. A chemical cocktail of enzymes, nucleotides, and primers, then placed in a thermal cycler to amplify. A 
color development process produces a series of blue dots, visualizing which variation of the DQ alpha gene is present in the genetic profile. If there is even one base difference in the 3.3 billion base pairs on an individual's DNA strand, the DNA will not bind to the corresponding dot. What we're looking for to see is how does um, this DNA that we've extracted compare to somebody else's DNA. Now, if the DNA is from a similar source, you'll get the same pattern of blue dots on a white strip. This is the genetic profile of the individual who licked the stamps. When the DNA profile of Paula Noraki and her husband were compared to the DNA from the back of the stamps, there was no match. For example, Paula Naraki has two dots here, and um, the DNA from the back of the postage stamp only has one. So therefore, right away, we can exclude Paula Naraki with just this one genetic marker. We looked at five different genetic markers, and at four out of five can exclude Paula Naraki. DNA was found, and it did not match Paula, and it did not match Len Naraki, which meant that someone licked that those stamps and it wasn't Len or Paul. We thought it was going to blow apart the whole case. We thought we thought we were done. Now, armed with the DNA profile of the stalker, the manhunt had just begun. When DNA testing of the stamps and envelope flap did not match Paula nor Rocky or her husband, the defense team went one step further. They wanted to find the individual whose DNA was on the threatening letters. If Paula didn't do it, there's only one other person that could have done it. Because there's only one other person that knew the circumstances of all these letters, that knew everything that was going on, that was Joanne Chambers. Was it possible that the alleged victim wrote the threatening letters and mailed them to herself? The defense uncovered some information which pointed in that very direction. Police in the neighboring town of Carbondale, Pennsylvania, told defense investigators that Chambers had a history of reporting suspicious incidents from burglaries to fires. They said every crime that she's been a victim of is, has some weirdness attached to it. And just off the top of their heads, they started relating different uh, crimes that supposedly she's been a victim of. When Anderson researched Chambers' employment history, he learned that Chambers reported similar threatening letters and also reported finding feces on her classroom chair while in another school district years earlier. She has a pattern of being a victim. And uh, having a pattern of being a victim shows one thing to me. I'm not an expert at, at all this, but it shows me you want attention from whoever. She wants to be the center of attention. To find out if it was Joanne Chambers' DNA on the threatening letters, Jim Anderson needed her DNA profile. For that, he looked in her trash. Once trash is placed at the curbside, the owner gives up all legal rights to what's inside. One plastic drinking straw. One used, looks like toilet tissue. Plastic straws, used tissues, and a cotton swab with earwax. All items with possible genetic material were sent to the DNA lab for testing. Dr. Lichtenwalner identified two different DNA profiles from the mucus, saliva, and earwax samples from the chamber's trash. One of those DNA profiles matched the DNA from the stamps and envelope flap. The DNA from the, uh, one of the household members was similar to the uh, DNA on the back of the stamps in the envelope. With these DNA results, the defense team demanded that all charges against Paul and Rocky be dropped. The prosecution refused, and Joanne Chambers provided a blood sample for further DNA testing. Once again, Joanne Chambers' blood DNA matched the DNA from the stamps and the envelope flap. You can see how all five genetic markers line up perfectly between the DNA of Joanne Chambers and the DNA from the back of the postage stamps. 
the odds of someone in the random U.S. population having the same combination of five genotypes tested was one in 14,925. The match was fairly significant in that, you know, that's a small community there, so it's unlikely that too many people are going to be walking around with a similar DNA pattern. Despite this second DNA test, the prosecution refused once again to drop their case against Paula Noraki. During the trial, the prosecution presented the circumstantial evidence against Paula Noraki, including the coffee cup incident and the Colonel Klink reference in one of the threatening letters. For the defense, Teachers from Joanne Chambers' former school district testified that she made similar claims of harassment years earlier. But it was the DNA evidence that stunned most courtroom observers. The DNA was definitely the bombshell. Um, to hear that uh, Joanne Chambers' saliva was found on the stamps of one of the, the threatening letters and the flap of another envelope it was just unbelievable. But on the witness stand, under oath, Joanne Chambers had an explanation. She said the prosecutor left her alone with the evidence and the stamps fell off one of the envelopes. She said she licked the stamps to reattach them and when that didn't work, used a glue stick. At the very least, she showed poor judgment and at the most, she tampered with uh, important evidence. The prosecution offered no explanation for why Joanne Chambers was left alone with the evidence, and no explanation was given for why her DNA was also found on the envelope flap. Dr. Lichtenwalner testified that she saw no glue stick residue on the stamps when she removed them for DNA testing. As a lifelong stamp collector, she has experience distinguishing glue stick residue from regular stamp adhesive. I know gum from knowing stamps, and it would look to me just like the gum on recent U.S. stamps. And it's smooth and glistening, and it looked just like that. There was no outward evidence that a glue stick had been used. The trial lasted five days, and it took the jury less than two hours to reach a verdict. They found Paula Noraki not guilty. The reaction after the verdict was the most amazing thing I've ever seen. The alleged victim was being treated as the defendant, and the defendant was being treated as the victim. In the hallway, jurors sought out Paula Naraki and hugged her and told her how much they loved her, while Joanne Chambers left the courthouse uh, virtually ignored. Joanne Chambers denies that she created the campaign of threats against her.